coordination. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to 2019 Stargaze from uh, the Northern Virginia Astronomy Club. I'm Chris Kagey. I'm this year's president. Wanted to welcome you all here. Uh, and before we kick everything off, just say a global thank you to all our speakers and our volunteers who have helped us put all of this together. There are two major public events like this that the club puts on every year. The, uh, one in the spring, we call Astronomy Day. It's very similar to this. And of course, Stargaze here. Both are in cooperation with Fauquier County and with Crockett Park. They are have been wonderful partners for years and years and years. And we are, you know, we look forward to continuing the cooperation and the partnership with with the park. And again, as I say, there are more volunteers who have put this together than I can hope to name right now. But everyone if you, as you walk around, if you see folks wearing the yellow Novak volunteer lanyards, or some of us are wearing Novak uh, volunteer shirts, all these people have been doing something to help make this happen. So, um, you know, give them a pat on the back or say thank you and, and uh, uh, let them know your appreciation. Also, keep thinking the good thoughts. The forecast has the clouds breaking as the sun sets. So, you know, God willing, we'll be able to see something tonight. Um, anyway, with that, I want to hand the microphone over to Paul Severance, who has uh, been our coordinator this year to put everything together here. And I want to give Paul the honor of introducing the speakers since he made the, uh, made the efforts to get them all arranged and invite people, in, invite them all to come. So he's certainly should have the honor of, of doing the introduction. So Paul, please, and thank you very much for everything you did. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you to everyone for sharing part of your weekend with us out here. We don't get to do this very often. Um, as Chris said, there's two kind of big events, this being one of them. Uh, but we also have several other outreach opportunities and programs throughout Northern Virginia, and you can find out about those on our website, novac.com, or you can just check here behind the tent at the information table. And you can get a feel for the wide variety of things that we do, and I'm sure you'll find, take, take interest in. We do generally like clear weather. It, it kind of helps a lot. But the, 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 the fact that we may or may not today means we can still participate in the, in the speakers here. And we have a terrific lineup for you. I think you're going to be really uh, pleased and, and excited to hear a wide range of topics. And uh, we wanted to start with, with Dan here. He's a Novak member for many years, I think going on 20 or so? 50, close to that. Close to 20 years. Um, I think he holds the Novak record for being a member of different state clubs. I think you're up to like six states now. Something, something like that. Something like yeah. that. I'm kind of looking for 50 from you at some point. <laughs> But, 54, but, 40, or 5. Yeah, that's right. But uh, Dan has been, it has so much knowledge on photography in general, astrophotography. Um, and, you know, he's going to share with us, you know, we all have one of these things that we carry around. It's got the camera. Um, I use it for selfies, but Dan's, <laughs> not really, but Dan's going to tell you a, a different way to use it at night doing, doing astrophotography. And I think that's really cool. So a uh, big welcome for, for Dan Ward, please. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. So let's see if we can get this. Uh, you know, I'm not. I'm not sure it's kicking here. All right, I'll do the old-fashioned way for now. Uh, okay. All right. So, how many people brought their sophisticated uh, astro imaging equipment with them tonight? Yeah. Okay, we have a couple here. Everybody else, you know, you, you probably have your phone, right? All right. So this may be the right talk for you guys. Maybe not so much for you. All right, so uh, just, uh, you know, what am I going to tell you? Stuffing things. Uh, talk a little bit about showing you some examples of what people have done with, with telephones, smartphones. Uh, talk about techniques a little bit. I'm going to go in some depth on iPhones because that's what I use. Most of what I talk about is applicable to Android as well. Um, and uh, a little bit on, uh, oh, I see. Resources, Sky stuff, I'm moving ahead. Art Cole has been doing this longer than anybody else I know. He's one of my friends on Flickr. Anybody use Flickr? A few people. So these are all photos that he took 
holding his he actually created a a mount to put his smartphone up to an eyepiece now you can buy those but when art started doing this they really weren't that available but all of these photos jupiter saturn mars and the moon and in this one he's showing uh, just right out of the camera and then after a little bit of processing so much more but it is amazing what you can do with one of these most people are uh, stunned to see it now just a wide field shot this is a guy in the philippines who, who took the milky way and by the way if you haven't been to the southern hemisphere they got first choice on the milky way i mean it's pretty nice up here but they really have a spectacular milky way down there now i believe he shielded the lighthouse for the initial uh, 20 second exposure of the milky way but, um, gary parkerson is a very cool guy anybody ever heard of him you would probably enjoy him in particular. He has been, since retirement, he's been bicycling around America. He carries a Teleview 60 millimeter telescope with him, and he shows people the night sky various places. Well, Gary uh, went to Nashville for the total eclipse last year, and he set his smartphone up to his little telescope, and he was doing it, and then he was totally socked in with clouds at totality. Oh. But uh, but he's still got some pretty cool photos, and, and he, these photos are actually on the Teleview website. I uh, have a friend in South Africa who's an electronic friend, and he's really stretching the, the limits of what can be done with just the smartphone. This is the Ryan Nebula. It will be visible tonight a little bit after 1 o'clock, so you probably we won't still be here then. But later on in the winter, this is one of the beautiful things to look at. Now, this particular thing is... 280 10 second exposures okay we have several kids here what's 280 times 10 what do you think 2800. right that's a lot of seconds of exposures right so probably not going to do some of those tonight but uh but it's possible to get these amazing photographs if you're willing to do it now mainly what I'm going to be talking about is what you can do just holding your telephone up your smartphone up to an eyepiece and taking a picture of the moon or something bright like uh, Jupiter or whatever but it's possible to do deep sky photography if you're dedicated and willing to take the time now I took this picture with a I often use a, a smartphone 6s that's not my main phone but I use it just for de demonstrations and such but the picture on the left I took just a, kind of walking up and taking a picture of the eyepiece on the right I processed it I cropped it just using the kind of image adjustment you can have on your phone itself just uh, increasing the contrast darkening a little bit and you can see you know it, it actually what do you think is that okay so if you go home tonight with something that looks like that, will you be happy? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Not super hard to do. If I can see the moon, yeah. then I'll be happy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a guy out here that has the cloud filters. He'll be coming around later, I think, to, to get him. Uh, I'm going to go back again. Actually, I'm going to pick on uh, Grant Peterson a couple of times because he is just totally amazing. By the way, Grant's day job, he's a software uh, engineer, so you know, the astronomy is just a hobby with him. That is a manual telescope. That is a, a Dobsonian telescope. It doesn't track the sky. You push it to keep up with the sky. He, he does other photos using a tracking one, but he took that picture of the occultation of Saturn by the moon using that yeah that's Saturn and then that's the zoom in now you have to be in the right place at the right time to see that and it's been happening uh, several times in the southern hemisphere lately we'll get our shot at it later but 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 it just amazes me he stacked the several photos because you need a different exposure to get Saturn than you do to get the bright moon but uh, pretty cool huh Anybody be happy to take that tonight? Yeah, yeah me too. <laughs> All right, so when you photograph through optics, let's talk about that for a minute. Um, we, whoops, we call that afocal photography. When you hold a phone up to a telescope, a, monocular, a set of binoculars, it's called afocal photography. There's different types of ways to take photos through a telescope. This is kind of the e easiest one. If you look on the internet, you will see some people, I'm sorry, am I in your way? Some people will call it digiscoping. That's because they have products they want to sell and they wanted a different name to use for it. But, uh, 
but it's possible to do a pretty good job. And anything we're talking about today on the afocal photography could be done with a telescope, a monocular, binocular. It's, it's, it's possible. Matter of fact, my first astrophoto was using the family's uh, brownie hawkeye uh, almost 60 years ago. And I, uh, I got a picture of the moon that looked, that's not the same picture I took, but roughly uh, that's what it looked like. And my father's reaction to this is, you wasted a whole roll of film and that's all you got? Yeah, okay, all right. He wasn't always the most supportive of astrophotography, but it's possible to get these images and it's been done for a long time. So what have we learned from the people that do this? Well, first off, your smartphone is so much better than that brownie Hawkeye that I had. Matter of fact, if, if you don't know who this guy is up here, that's Ansel Adams. Ansel Adams was a concert pianist who got into photography and he started taking big uh, landscape photos and he's widely recognized as probably one of the greatest landscape photographers that's ever lived. He also wrote five books on the technical aspects of photography because once he got into it, that was his life. Your smartphone has most of what he taught in those books built into it automatically. So when you press the button on, the, on your camera, it's actually got all this wisdom built into it. And it will do a lot of the stuff for you. Now the, the, ne the only negative about that is your, your phone is designed primarily for daytime photography. It's for snapshots, you know. Um, you know Anybody want to take a, a selfie right now? I mean, there, that's the most common photograph, but smartphone is a selfie, you yeah. know. But it's got all kinds of capability. So how can we leverage that capability? Because some of the stuff that works great for daytime photography is not necessarily nice for nighttime photography. Well, native, it does a great job on wide views. You know, if, if I were to take a picture of the crowd right now, you know, it, it, it would be a, a pretty decent shot. Even though it's a little dark in here, it, it's going to come out okay. Uh, if you, most of the cameras have some kind of zoom capability. A lot of zoom is not necessarily good because you have two or three natives uh, lens capability, optical zoom if you will. But once you start zooming in digitally, you're getting a lot of noise in it and it, it kind of trashes it up. So if you're looking at something in a telescope, zoom in a little bit to fill the frame, but don't super zoom in or you'll, you'll get less and less detail. It will get fuzzier and fuzzier. You know, it's, it's like looking at a TV screen with a magnifying glass. You see lots of pixels and yeah, kind of lose the effect. Um, any questions on this stuff yet? I don't know. I'll just kind of keep moving here. So, so most of these uh, adapters have no optics in them. They're just a mechanical thing to align the, the, the camera to it. Do some have any optics? Uh, most of them don't have any optics. You, uh, you, some, you, there's a way to add in a Barlow lens or something like that to, to increase it. And there are snap-on optics that are basically little monoculars that will snap on. And it's possible to actually use a, a snap-on monocular and look through a telescope, but the quality's not there. Okay. So your native setting, meaning if you just pick it up out of the box, no other special software, uh, most phones and uh, the iPhones, at least through the X models, I don't know about the 11, uh, normally it's going to take a picture somewhere between a third of a second and an eight thousandth of a second. You see the ISO, that's how, ISO is how sensitive the, the phone is to, to light. Um, but most of the time your phone is making adjustments using the shutter speed. To the degree we can override that, we can get better night photos. So when you're taking the moon, it's not as much of an issue, but when you start taking pictures of other things, it will become an issue if, if you go that far. The eight, the eight has. The question was what iPhone has uh, eight thousandth of a Second, the iPhone 8s and later have that, or even more, I think, with the, the latest one. Any other questions? Thanks. But for us, photography, you're slow, you can't Yeah, you, you, won't, you won't slow rather than fast for astrophotography. Yep. So when you're, when you're setting it up, first off, you don't want to use flash. We have a rule at Star Parties, no white light. And your flash is not going to make you a lot of friends at a star party. 
plus it's not going to, you know, the moon is 280,000 miles away roughly. Uh, flash isn't going to do a whole lot there, you know. And everything else in the sky is a lot further than the moon, so, you know, your flash is, it's not going to help anything on the photo, and it's going to annoy the people around you that are, you know, trying to look in the dark. So if, if you can turn the flash off, that's cool. Rear camera, the rear camera is great for selfies, but you want to be shooting the back, the back side of the camera, not the rear side of the camera. You, you get the maximum resolution that way. If you can, uh, you probably want to dim the display if you're out at a dark site. Again, tonight, uh, not exactly a deep sky night. Uh, probably less of an issue here, but in general, if you're at a star party, you want to dim the display as, as dim as you can use it and still be able to see what you need to see. All right. Uh, I'm not going to go through each of these because I know people want to do other things here too, but um, the video frame rate, if you decide to do video, uh, then you should at, uh, use the faster frame rate, rate uh, at least 30 frames per second. Uh, most cameras these days, phones have the 60 frames per second. And feel free to take pictures of any of these if you want to. I think we may get this posted on the website at some point. I don't know how soon that happens, but you know, if, if you take pictures of the frame, it, it, it doesn't offend me. I'm happy to share all, all of this. All right, so a question came up earlier. Can you do it just handheld as opposed to using a bracket? Yeah, you can. Yeah, but it, it, it kind of wiggles, right? So if you really want to get a good result, so we're holding our phone, right? And uh, we have to hold this parallel to the eyepiece, you know? And we need to keep it still. And we don't want to jiggle the telescope because especially some of the Dobsonian telescopes, you push the camera, uh, the phone against the telescope, you move it off the object that you were just looking at. And, you know, what fun is that? Uh, don't, be careful when you're doing that. Don't put your fingers on the eyepiece. You know. there's some of these eyepieces are fairly expensive, even the ones that are not fairly expensive. Uh, peanut butter and jelly fingerprints don't do a thing for it. I had a kid pour some apple cider on one of my eyepieces. It did not enhance the view one little bit. Um, but if you think of, uh, you, if, if you're into aviation, y'all pitch and roll, you know, you're very familiar with those concepts. Um, the phone, you have three dimensions that you're working with here. And holding the phone steady is, is not impossible, but it's not easy for most people. Okay. Any kind of vibration is not your friend when you're taking photos. So pitch is up and down, y'all is left to right, and roll. All of those will get you a blurrier photo than if you can keep it parallel to the eyepiece, perpendicular to the line, optical line. Is this making sense? Yeah. yeah. So you can do it handheld, but there are things to make it easier. And holding is a good thing in astronomy. Maybe not so much in football, depending on which team you're rooting for. We had some people arguing about that earlier. Uh, okay, you can do it with rubber bands. Okay, that's about as cheap as it comes. There are inexpensive phone mounts, and I have a couple of examples here after the talk if somebody wants to take a look at it. And then there are very custom mounts that, that will run in the neighborhood of $80 to $100. So the good news is you can spend as much money as you want to on this. The good news is you can also do it very cheap. And you can just handhold it. It's just you have to work a little bit harder to handhold it and get good results. So I, I didn't see John Soika here earlier. I don't know if he's here yet or, or not, but he's, he has a really good talk on more advanced, more sophisticated astrophotography using a smartphone. And it's on the uh, Novak uh, YouTube channel. But it is, he really gets into some of the more sophisticated software and techniques for that. I'm, I'm keeping this more for a broad general audience. Uh, but you know, John is much, very much a fan of using the, the rubber bands. That, that works. Uh, it, it doesn't work as well for me. I'm older than John. You know. Some of the examples, and I have uh, all three of these up. Well, I'd, actually, I don't have the next, the Celestron next YZ just recently came out. But the other two, the, the Teleview is probably the most expensive, sophisticated one, but it only works with certain Teleview eyepieces, but it screws right into it. It's about as snug as it, you can get. And uh, it, it's kind of once you get it set up and aligned, you can do photography uh, all night long, whatever you want to do. 
Uh, the Ryan Steady picks will fit a variety of eyepieces, so you don't have the issue of being stuck with just uh, <coughs> Teleview eyepieces. But it's fairly expensive, but it's uh, fairly sophisticated. The next YZ is, I like I said, it just came out. I haven't actually seen one in use yet, but it, it's cheaper than the other two. And then if you just want to take the wide field shots, you know, there's all kinds of things. The, the, the Manfrotto thing, uh, it's great for selfies. My do one of my daughters uses these. Uh, the eye stabilizer, I've seen these in like, you know, five and below stores. It's, it's a nice way to set your camera up. You can set it on the timer and, and get a nice group shot. But of course, at the end, yeah, you can just cut a cup. Uh, and if you have a poppet, a poppet actually will, you know, hold your phone up. Okay, anybody use those? You know what I'm talking about? Okay, it's, it's a little uh, dial that sits on the back that pops out, and it will it will prop your phone up. Problem is, if you have one of those on, it's kind of hard to get your phone in one of those holders. So, uh, so some of the steps. Again, this is specifically for the way iPhones work. I believe the this works very well for uh, the uh, Android phones as well. Uh, I know most of the Galaxies. My Son-in-law has a Galaxy, and it seemed to be pretty much the same. But on the camera app itself, be sure you turn the flash off. The HDR, the high digital, high digital resolution, I recommend having it on. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. If you have a timer, I recommend turning it off. And it seems like you might want the timer, but the problem with the timers is it flashes the LED light with the countdown. And again, flashing a white light at a star party is not a popular thing to do. You're messing up people's night vision. Uh, if you go out at, uh, under a night sky, it takes 30 seconds for your eyes to begin to adjust to the night vision, but it takes at least 30 minutes before they really truly adjust to, to night vision. Any white light starts that count all over again. So that's why people don't like to see white light at a star party because you want to be able to see better in the dark. Okay. Um, if the adjust pops up, I always say uh, original. I don't want some kind of grunge effect when I'm taking a picture of the moon. I mean, maybe later I want to do that effect on it, but, but not right out of the box, you know. Uh, the square format, I'm taking a picture of a round eyepiece. So it's a, a round, it's a square hole and a round peg. That makes more sense than a big rectangle. So, but it doesn't matter. You can use whatever you're used to with your phone. But a square portrait is less wasteful of space around the picture that you don't need. Uh, there's a yellow box for the auto f auto exposure, auto focus. If you hold your finger down on that, it will lock it. If you don't, you may find it jumping around, so it's easier to lock it. And once you have it locked, you can swipe up and down to adjust the brightness of the image, the auto exposure. And that will give you a, a better moon picture in particular if you can adjust it down. Is it making sense? Okay. If you go to the settings area and you go to the camera setting, I always want to put it on preserve settings because otherwise every time you take a picture, you're starting all over again. And I want to use the same settings I had for the last photo. When you're doing uh, several pictures of the moon, this will save you some time. And then you can turn it off later. Uh, the auto HDR, <laughs> if you turn that on, it will always take an HDR photo. If you don't turn it on, the, the phone will decide whether or not you need one. And sometimes it and I agree, often it and I do not agree. So turn it on, it stays on. Now, HDR. What that really means, without getting into the technical aspects of it, is it takes one photo that's underexposed, one photo that's normally exposed according, according to what the phone thinks should be a, a good exposure, and one that's overexposed, and then it merges those three photos to try to get the maximum quality out of the image. Usually an HDR photo will be better than just a native one. If you say keep normal, it will save the native, the normal photo, and the HDR photo. That way. If sometimes HDR doesn't make it a better image, and this way you'll have both. If you have uh, issues with the memory on your phone, then, then don't save it. And uh, while you're at it, if you're going to do video later, I just check and make sure it's at least 30 sec uh, frames per second. Okay. All right. I think I, I probably explained all of this, but again, when when you're looking at your phone and you 
you'll see the screen for the focus. You center that where you want the focus to be. You want your focus at an infinity. It's usually going to do that um, automatically. But if, then hold it down so you lock it so the focus isn't zooming in and out and getting weird on you. And then you can swipe your finger up and down to adjust the, the exposures, the brightness of the image. Okay. And it will stay locked until you either take a picture or you exit the, the, the camera. Is this making sense? Okay. If uh, if you have a plug-in headphone or even the, your camera, your phones will use the volume control as a shutter release as well as the shutter button. So you know you have the big red button for your camera. The volume will also take a picture. That's almost all phones have it set up that way. If you plug in a headphone, your volume control on the headphone will do that. Bluetooth headphones are supposed to do that as well. Mine don't. I have Beats headphones. The volume control does not take pictures. You might if you try that. But it's a way of taking a picture without putting your, your, your fingers on it. But they also have these little Bluetooth shutter releases that you can get for about 10 bucks or less on uh, Amazon. And that's one in the upper uh, right there. So that's another way to, to take the picture without having to put your finger on the phone and possibly moving it or dislodging it. Making sense? Capture, that's picture. good. Uh, yeah, that yeah, that's that's a that's a good point. I don't know if the new iPhone does that or not, but the w version I have didn't have that. But uh, audio. So, just repeating. Uh, so, uh, some phones have audio triggers, so you can say, snap or whatever, you know, and it will take the picture then. So that's a good way to take a picture without having to touch it and maybe jiggling the phone. Timer delay, I recommend you against using it at a star party for what I said before. It's going to blink the countdown and that white light is not going to make you any friends at a star party. Um, the timer delay will take 10 identical photos unless you have it set on HDR or you have the flash turned on, that it will only take one. But my recommendation again for astronomy is, is to not use the uh, timer. Okay. All right. Uh, high dynamic range. I, I talked about this a little bit before. It, it will, it under, over, and normal exposes an image. It blends the three of them together to give you a little slightly better quality picture. If you haven't experimented with it, I recommend doing it. It's great for daytime snapshots, portraits, things like that, too. It, it's a handy feature to have. Doesn't work in every circumstance. That's why when I take one of those, I always save the regular picture, too, which you can get from the other setting. And it will override the, the, if you're using HDR with a timer, it will override the 10 shot. It will not override the LED blinking countdown. So again, I don't recommend using the timer at a star party, but the, but the HDR I do. There are some phone apps that give you much more control so that your smartphone will be more like a 35 millimeter or a eight high di uh, single lens reflex or a more sophisticated camera. Um, I use Pro, Pro Camera on my uh, my phone. I'm, I'm very happy with it. All of these are probably equally good. I use Pro Camera because I've been using it for about six or seven years, Didn't, and they keep upgrading it. There's something called the Photographer's Ephemeris. It's a little bit more expensive than the others. It tells you exactly where the sun and the moon will rise or set. If you like to take sunrise photos or sunset photos or moonrise or moonset photos, yeah, it you can look it on your phone and see exactly where it's going to be on your horizon. This means if you really want to get a cool picture of, say, the moon rising next to a, a national monument or in somebody's wheelbarrow or jumping through a basketball hoop, it's it's your app. It will t show you exactly where it will be. Pretty cool. Questions? All right, post processing. Uh, three main softwares I'll mention here. Planetary Imaging Preprocessor, that's a mouthful. If you take multiple pictures, if everything in the sky is moving, and some of the scopes you see tonight will be tracking very, very well. Some of them won't be tracking at all. 
if the image is moving across a screen, especially if you're looking at Mars or Jupiter or something like that, one of the big advantages of, of the PIPP software is it will adjust all the images so that they're all in the same place and you can stack them more readily as opposed to having to manually move them back and forth. Registax does a little bit of that. PIPP does it better. Uh, Deep Sky Stacker is, is another... <sighs> I'm not going to go into in-depth. Look at uh, Soika, John Soika's uh, presentation I mentioned earlier, and there, there's a link here later, because he goes into this software a little bit more depth, and it's a lot of technical stuff to get in. We have a very mixed audience here, and I don't want to put everybody to sleep. But uh, but these are good, and the, uh, a couple of these are free. Um, I use Registack. I've used Deep Style Stacker a couple of times. I haven't used PIPP. I probably will in the future. Dan? Yeah. No, those would be on a laptop or desktop. Uh, I told you before, Grant Peterson is is the best of the best on this. I got I, I just have to show you this. That that uh, I don't know how well you can see it because of how bright it is. That's the planet Mercury. That's the planet Venus. That's the International Space Station. That's Mars. That's Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. All of those taken with a smartphone looking through an eyepiece of a Dobsonian telescope. And of course the sun and the moon. So he uses a Samsung Galaxy. He was using an 8. He's uh, upgraded to a 10. Um, and with all of these, he does a minute of video and then stacks them and pulls it together. The, the, uh, the Registack that I mentioned earlier, if you do a, a minute of video, I said before 30 frames per second, so what's 30 times 60? Anybody know that one? <laughs> 1,800. So he has 1,800 frames to pick from. And Registack will, will throw out the worst ones and keep the best ones. You see, if when we're looking up in the sky, you're looking through at least 60 miles of atmosphere, and it's turbulent. And stuff is constantly moving. So, you know, when you look at the pictures, you see this wonderful picture of the moon or Jupiter. When you look at an eyepiece on a telescope, you'll see it, it's kind of waving and, and wa wobbling just a little bit. And that's because of all the atmospheric motion going on. If you have 1,800 frames, you have some, some lots of little frames there where the seeing was absolutely perfect. And a bunch where it wasn't. The software will, will toss out the less beautiful frames, if you will, and stack the ones that were very good and then it adds it all together to give you a much finer image. So that's the advantage of doing video. But again, if you're taking pictures of planets, things like that, it's really good. With the moon, it's help, helpful, but you, again, you can get a good snapshot of the moon just taking your phone and uh, snapping it through the eyepiece. You can get a much better picture when you start doing stacking. And this is the gear I asked, I asked Grant the other day. Uh, by the way, he's on Twitter. If you're a Twitter person, you can follow him. Um, but this is his main gear. Celestron XL eyepiece. It's a nice eyepiece. Shorty Barlow, the question earlier about something in between. And basically, he's using this device to hold his phone. The eyepiece is mounted onto here. And in that case, he's using a Barlow to increase the, the power, if you will, of the eyepiece through his telescope. But uh, this is about as simple as it gets. This particular device is uh, Solomark, uh, $16. This one, which I prefer to use, the Teleview, $100. Has the same function. This is a little bit more stable. This works. Yeah, I'm, I don't know the details on that. I'm assuming he probably caught it either g getting close to or away from the moon and just took a, it was a lot of videos and probably integrated a few of them for that. Yeah. I know when I shoot the ISS, I've always shot videos of it, and I've gotten a couple of transits across the moon that way. But, uh, I one, did want to mention uh, next month on Veterans Day, November 11th, we have a very unique uh, opportunity. The planet Mercury 
is going to transit across the sun. Now, what that means is our orbits are aligned to such a degree that occasionally, every so many years, the Mercury passes between us and the sun. Now, when the moon passes between us and the sun, we get an eclipse. When Mercury passes in front of the sun, it's way too far away for us to get an eclipse. So what we get is a transit. The same thing happens with Venus. It's not going to happen again with Venus for a couple or hundred and something years. We had a nice one a few years ago. Mercury, we had a nice transit on in 2016. We had this next one coming up on uh, Veterans Day. And then it's not going to happen in Northern Virginia until uh, 2032. So Veterans Day is a holiday, so if you're not working, if you're not in school, Fairfax County Parks Department has a public observing session set up at the uh, Great Falls uh, at Turner Farm Observatory Park. The, the uh, transit starts at 7 o'clock. Yes? You can use eclipse glasses, but Mercury's so small, you, you have to have a telescope to see it. It's just a tiny dot. You need the filter in front of whatever you're shooting, not not behind it. But but yeah, yeah. So so if uh, I've seen people that took take uh, the uh, eclipse glasses and put them over, you know, like a mon binocular, monocular, or something like that. As long as you've you know, you, yeah, you don't want to look directly at the sun. Our eyes are too expensive. Yeah, and uh, actually, this device on the left, uh, one of the one of the Novak members, this is called a sun spotter, and it projects the sun down and, and gets a ball that's about uh, 10 inches in diameter. That's a pretty cool way to see it too. Uh, and he'll be at the uh, Analemma event in Great Falls. I just wanted to mention that because that's a very cool event, right? and it's not going to happen again until 2032. I know you want to go ahead and plan ahead for 2032, but just in case, you might want to make this one next month. Okay, this, th I know this is an eye chart. There's a lot of more details up here. I uh, mentioned the, uh, the transit. The next lunar eclipse in North America will be on January 10th, so a few months ahead. It's a penumbral lunar eclipse. That is not as cool as the one we just had a few months uh, back in January, but you will notice some darkening of the moon. If you want to look at that. The next uh, solar eclipse is in South America. So Argentina, Chile, Polynesian cruises, uh, that's on December next year. If you want to go to that, my wife and I are willing to go with you and, and talk to you about it. Just, just let me know. Just buy our tickets and we'll be there. <coughs> the next lunar eclipse, full lunar eclipse, is, uh, is May 2021. And I did want to mention that uh, there are meteor showers throughout the year. The best one year after year is the Perseids. And that's always around August 12th, 13th. Um, so if you want to try to catch some meteors, that, that's always a good one that you can count on. Some of the others you can't always count on being quite as good. There's some other links here. Uh, here's a, the link from Novak. Here's a thing for uh, the Turner Forum events, uh, Analemma Society, which is another group. The smartphone astrophotography, John Soika's presentation, got the link here. Uh, there's a really good astronomy club in Laurel, Maryland. Unfortunately, there's not a good astronomy shop in uh, in Northern Virginia anymore, but uh, he's got all kinds of cool stuff there. Online Orion telescopes. Uh, Naval Observatory has a lot of good astronomy related stuff. Uh, Sky and Telescope astronomy magazines have tons and tons of good downloadable stuff. If you're a subscriber, more is available than if you're not a subscriber, but there's plenty of stuff that's available for somebody that just goes online and looks. Uh, Put a few other things here. Art Cole that I showed at the very beginning, uh, he's got a lot of stuff on his uh, Flickr site that talks about the techniques he uses. Very cool guy. Martin Payot has an 80 minute, very detailed tutorial that tells you everything you ever wanted to know and maybe a little bit more. Uh, and Registax, that software I talked about, which does absolutely miracles with processing images. Uh, very good tutorial on that. And there's a little disclaimer there that anything that I'm showing here is just for example purposes. Novak is not recommending and I'm not personally recommending it, but I found some of these work well for me. Whether or not it works well for you, after, you know, buyer beware. But, uh, now I have a few other things. How are we doing on time? 
Okay, uh, here, I wanted to show some more images. By the way, I took that uh, photo last night. I set my telescope up in the driveway, took my camera out, took the picture, put my telescope back in the garage. I was out in the driveway for like five minutes. And that was doing none of the stuff I was talking about other than just holding the phone up to the eyepiece. So you can get a decent photo of the moon very easily. You can get some really cool stuff if you put a little more effort into it. But, you know, the clouds are going to magically all open up by sunset and we'll have a wonderful view of the moon tonight and uh, we'll be able to see these things. I did want to just reinforce what I uh, said just briefly at the beginning. Uh, there's about 60 miles of atmosphere over our heads. Most of it is in the first few miles. If you look straight up, you have one air mass above you. If you look about 30 degrees up, you have two air masses that you're looking through. If you look close to the horizon, you have almost six air masses. That's a lot of stuff. That's a lot of dirt, air, wind, water, vapor, moisture, and all. So the closer to the horizon you are, the more turbulence you will have in your images. So if you want to take a picture of the moon, if you want to get a moon rise, it's going to be the horizon. But if it's higher up, you'll actually have a cleaner shot at it than you will when it's down low or any other object for that matter. Does that make sense? Now, I know, you know, you know when you see the moon rise and it's ginormous and you look up and it's really tiny? Is that, does that really happen? So if, if you will extend your arm and hold up your little finger, you'll see when the moon's at the horizon, it's the same size as your little fingernail for most people. And when it, you look up over your head, it's the same size as your little fingernail. It's, it's an optical illusion because you see stuff on the horizon that makes it seem to be much bigger. So, you know, try that because you, you shouldn't believe it. Don't, don't take my word for it. I might be trying to sell you something. Look and see if it works. You know? All right, make sure I didn't skip something. Okay. Lots of lo different lunar, lunar phrases. I actually find crescent moon photos are a lot cooler than like near full moon photos. So I just encourage you, uh, look at different times. I took all these photos. Uh, these particular photos I took through one of my telescopes, not with my camera, but all of these would be possible with a, with a smartphone. Denise Silva is a, was a local photographer. Poor lady, she had to move to Montana. Um, she did this wonderful shot of the moon rising through the Air Force Memorial. I did the shot of the moon over the uh, uh, Washington Monument. Uh, I waited almost three years to get this photo because I'm an OCD person that I wanted to have the actual moon. And there's only twice a year that the moon rises in that alignment and it was cloudy most of the time. So I did finally get it, but I still had to do two exposures to be able to get the monuments in and the moon in. Looking at the full moon is like looking at a, a, a bare light bulb. So you need a, a, a very fast exposure for the full moon and needed a longer exposure to get the monuments. But you can get stuff like this. That app I told you about earlier, the uh, uh, yeah, uh, Photographers Ephemeris will help you find these alignments of a cool sunrise and sunsets. This one I took from near the foot of the Iwo Jima Memorial. Most of the photos like this you see today will be taken from the Netherlands, Carolina, because some of these trees in the foreground have gotten a lot taller. I tell people to take the same photo today, you need a chainsaw. <laughs> <laughs> but I took this in uh, like 2005, I think, 2006. Um, so it, yeah, it's, it's kind of cool because I prefer this alignment. When from the Netherlands, Carolyn, it flips so the Washington Monument would be over here and the Capitol would be on the right, but the moon would still be roughly there. Yeah, the Netherlands, Carolyn would be the, the place to, to try to duplicate this kind of a shot today. Yeah. Also, I wanted just, uh, you know, myth busters here just for a second. You, you hear about the super moon? Yeah, sometimes you hear about the micro moon or some people call it the mini moon. The moon's orbit around the Earth is elliptical, so sometimes it's closer to the Earth, sometimes it's farther away. This is as big as it gets and as small as it gets. So when people talk about we're having a super moon tonight and it's like, you know, it, it's going to knock your eyeballs out, it's going to be so bright, maybe not so much. Uh, that's, that's the actual difference in size. Now, because, you know, the diameter of the area of a circle, that's about a 14% difference. 
But, you know, it's not really ginormous versus teeny tiny. It's subtle. But it's cool. Did anybody observe the lunar eclipse back in January? It was really cold, wasn't it? I, I spent five hours out in my driveway to get these, these photos of it. And right, at, right after I snapped this particular image, a fox ran right next to me. I'd been sitting still for so long, you know, and it just ran past me. That was pretty cool, you know. But, of course, I don't use white light, no flash, so I couldn't take a picture of the fox, you know. Uh, by the way, this, this is uh, on the Tel Aviv website. And again, the next uh, penumbral partial lunar eclipse is January. Next total one like this would be May of 2021. Cool? Okay, Jupiter, we will see Jupiter tonight. At about 7.30, the, uh, all four moons of Jupiter will be visible when it first gets dark. At about 7.30 tonight, the moon Io will drift behind Jupiter. So that's kind of cool to see as it gets closer. When they go in front of Jupiter, you actually see the shadow of a moon going in front like, like you do. That's the shadow, that's the actual moon. But it, it's kind of cool because there's always stuff happening on Jupiter with the, the four largest moons orbiting it. Uh, Saturn will be visible the f early tonight. I, I think it sinks, uh, sets pretty quickly, but it is gorgeous. If you've never seen Saturn to a telescope, you owe it to yourself to see it. It's very, they're both very cool. Just mentioning meteors, it's interesting. This photo is, is, is out on the internet, is a Perseid meteor shower at Stonehenge. Those are not actually meteors. That is a star trail photo. So the photographer that made this was making a very beautiful picture of Stonehenge to advertise the meteor shower. But as you see, all of these are actually moving in the same direction and the same length. Meteor shower would not look like that. But it's still a cool picture. But you can take pictures of a meteor shower with your phone. Normally, you're only going to get one or two streaks. Okay, questions? Star Trail photos are cool. There are apps that will make even cooler Star Trail photos than your phone will take because they'll just make it look like that. Yeah, okay, well that's that's fine. You know, if you want something that looks cool, uh, Denise Silva, who had done the the moon rise at the Air Force Memorial, she she did this one, and those really are true Star Trails. And she did not have the light on in her tent until after she had the Star Trail photos, because otherwise that would have just been burned out. But uh, she stacked uh, quite a few, uh, uh, 100 minute, uh, four minute exposures for this. So she was, you know, working hard. At, by the way, she does workshops on aurora photography that are just amazing. That's not a cell phone, that's uh, that's No, that was a, a, one of her, that was a Canon actually. But it is possible to do those. Uh, there's several, uh, there's some uh, YouTube links to how to do that. Partial solar eclipse are more common than, uh, than total. The next annular eclipse in North America is on October 14, 2023. It comes up through the Gulf of Mexico, goes through Texas, and, and, and exit up through um, uh, Washington State. It is an annular eclipse. That means the, the moon is further away, so it doesn't completely uh, cover the sun. So it's a ring of fire instead of the totality we get with a total eclipse. Uh, but from here, it will be a partial eclipse. So if you have y your solar filter from last time or something, you can kind of get some cool effects. I was at uh, Cape Hatteras for this partial eclipse uh, back in October uh, a few years ago. All right. Oh. And just f for no particular reason, I threw in my total eclipse photo. I was, uh, I was 21 miles away from the guy on the bicycle that got clouded out. So it was the luck of the draw. I had a wonderful experience. He's uh, maybe not so much, but it is a wonderful experience to see a, a total solar eclipse. What's the Apollo 12 uh, reference there? Yeah. Oh, uh, when Apollo 12 was on the moon, um, Alan Bean, uh, Pete Conrad was taking devices off of an earlier Ranger uh, satellite they'd been crashed into the moon. They wanted to see what the effect of being on the moon had done to those devices. Alan Bean was supposed to be set doing photography. The guys on Earth told him to set the camera up and they pointed it with the, the sun in the background. The sun burned out the sensor on his camera in like 30 seconds. And from that point on, they did not have a functioning video camera on Apollo 12. 
Uh, there, there, apparently there was some nautical terminology that was used online during... <laughs> I met Alan Bean a few years ago, and he still doesn't want to talk about it, even though it wasn't his fault. He was doing exactly what ground control was telling him to do. But, but if you point your camera towards the sun, you can damage the, the sensors. And that's the same shot where earlier he fixed the broken camera by hitting it with a hammer. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's it. Any questions? Hello. Uh, so to uh, uh, safely look at the Mercury transit or a partial solar eclipse, you can take a uh, binocular on a tripod and project it onto a white surface. You want to focus it so it's so close to that surface that no one can physically put their head behind the eyepiece because that would be the last thing you looked at. Uh, uh, but you can do that and you can practice doing this setup with a full moon. So uh, full moon you can look at, so you can get it centered and all that kind of stuff and figure out the geometry and, and all of that and project it onto a white piece of paper. You'll want for the sun to have something that, uh, that, that makes shade for uh, the, the binoculars. Uh, well, you can yeah, you can put put it in a in a box with just one eyepiece, one one ocular, the front eyepiece. Uh, the other one you want capped, uh, uh, you know, taped over whatever on the front of it, so that no light goes through that path. The other one is going to be exposed to the sun, and then you make shade behind that and project it onto a white thing. So I set it up for the uh, Mercury or the Venus transit, uh, <laughs> and projected it onto my white car uh, in a parking lot. And that uh, worked out just fine. Uh, no, no, my car is my car is fine, uh, but you do, but you do want to uh, uh, cap the other ocular so that uh, it it doesn't. Yes, there there are other projection techniques, but everybody's got binoculars. Everybody has a tripod, so yeah. But but to your point, uh, I mean, you know those those clip-on lens are, are like this monocular, so yeah, you could use that for projection as well. Okay. Cool. Dan, thank you. Thank you.